Morning. Uh, you'll maybe notice a, a disparity between the uh, sermon title in your bullet and what you're going to hear. Um, that's because yesterday I felt impressed to talk about something else. That happens every now and then. And I think I was going to talk about being a dynamic Christian. And the title of our message today is The Days of Noah and Lot. I believe Jesus is coming very soon. Amen. And uh, many of us, I think, knew the way the Supreme Court might vote. It's hard to believe it's only been a few years that here in California, the majority of California citizens voted Proposition 8, that marriage is between a man and a woman. It would seem like that's a self-evident truth. And the vote between the justices was certainly not unanimous. Five against four, which means it boils down to the vote of one person, has changed the definition of marriage for the first time since the inception of the United States. It goes back farther than that. First time since the inception of Christianity. But um, Jesus gives us some good news. He tells us that... Uh, Cheer up. This is a sign I'm coming soon. Luke 17. Luke 17, verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. Now I want you to notice some specific things that Jesus highlights. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought and they sold. They planted and they built. But on that day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus told us that conditions in the world would be uh, people totally absorbed with the cares of this life. They'd be doing things that actually you do when you have a long forecast. You don't get married if you don't think you've got a little future. You don't plant if you don't think you've got a future. You don't build a house to have it burnt down next week. All of these things are things you do because you're anticipating, I've got a long time ahead of me. But it happens suddenly. Now, Jesus said, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Now, history tends to repeat itself. And you can see a repeat in the way that God dealt with his own nation as you track the history of Israel. I was looking at uh, Edward Gibbon's classic on the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And he identifies five prime reasons for Rome's downfall. And I thought that you'd see that some of these things may actually apply to us today, which would be reason for concern, at least as a country. Encouragement as a Christian. One, the undermining of the dignity and the sanctity of the family and the home. Now, this was written, oh, I don't know, he wrote this a couple, uh, 150, 200 years ago. It's not a new book. But one of the things that brought down Rome, you know, Rome... We think about Rome, we think of the wild Roman or orgies and, and the Colosseums and the fighting and all, but it wasn't always that way. Uh, there was actually time during Augustus Caesar, also known as Octavian, he ruled for 40 years or during the time of Christ's birth, actually. And uh, he had some very strict policies about the family. They actually had, compared to what you hear, some high morals. But, you know, some countries start out with the best of intentions and then they lose it. Our country started out, I think, with some very high principles and ideals. One, the undermining of the dignity and sanctity of the home and the family. Two, increasing taxes and spending of public money for food and circuses or entertainment. They had a, a very large program of supplying free food for people at the taxpayer's expense. It kept the poor from rioting, so they were willing to do that. 
Three, he itemizes the mad craze for pleasure with sports becoming more exciting and more brutal. Now, I don't know that, you know, football games aren't near as bad as the gladiators, but they do have extreme fights. People get in a cage and bludgeon each other until one's virtually unconscious. Four, the building of armaments when the real enemy was the decadence of the people within. They spent so much time investing in preparing to fight an enemy on the outside when what ended up happening was deterioration on the inside. America has the largest military budget in the world. Even though Chinese, China has a bigger army, we spend more on the military than anybody. Five, the decay of religion with faith fading into mere form. Philip Meyer goes on with his book, The Rise and Fall, observed, almost from the beginning, the Roman stage was gross and immorality was one of the main agencies to which must be attributed the undermining of the originally sound moral life. At one time there was a sound moral life in Rome. But he said the stage. <laughs> you think about the stage, I mean, you know, they didn't have DVDs back then. They didn't have Netflix. But they had the theater. You'll see that they built theaters wherever they put a Roman center of civilization. I've been to them. They've got them in Rome. They've got them in Israel. Got them in Carthage. And wherever they had a Roman settlement, they'd have the theater. And people were so preoccupied with the latest performance and their favorite actors that they almost became detached from reality. So absorbed did the people become, I'm still quoting from Philip Meyer, so absorbed did the people become in the indecent representations of the stage, they lost all thought and care for the affairs of real life. I don't think it's been but a few weeks ago, James Dobson, who his work on trying to help families is worthy of our respect, he said, gay marriage signals the fall of Western civilization. Yesterday, Dr. Jerry Johnson, he's a friend of mine, president of the NRB, declared, this judicial activism is a slap at democratic governance and it shows disdain for the holy institution that has been the bedrock of human society for millennia. Amen. Now, you'll have people who say, it doesn't matter. Give everybody freedom. If you love, just, you get to love whoever you want. But you know, all of the arguments that were considered and used to endorse same-sex marriage, those very same arguments can be used for three people getting married. They can be used for one man, two women, one woman, two men, a man and his pet alpaca. As long as they're consenting and loving, I mean, this is the kind of logic that's being used. You should hear some of the consent, uh, the dissenting. If you haven't read what the other justices, the dissenting justices wrote, pretty scathing. Matter of fact, one said this is the worst decision ever made by the Supreme Court as far as law. But what does it mean for us? Well, it means Jesus is coming soon. We have a work to do. And there may be trials for us coming as a people and a country. I just need to tell you what I see historically. Paul said, 2 Timothy 3, 1, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. You know, there are an increasing number of professed Christian denominations. I'm not talking about little ones. I'm talking about some of the biggest who now are endorsing same-sex marriage and they even have uh, actively practicing homosexual clergy all in the name of the Lord, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And I respect that people have a right to believe different things. But if you're going to say you're a Bible Christian, 
It's just amazing to me the contortions that people put the Bible through to justify what they're doing. Because they want enough religion to soothe their conscience, but they don't really want to surrender their lives and obey. Seventh-day Adventists are people that believe not only are we saved by grace, but because we're saved by grace, we obey God. Amen. You know, it's interesting, this quote that I read from Jesus in Luke 17 about the days of Noah and Lot, it explains conditions before and during the flood. Peter repeats this. If you look in 2 Peter 2, verse 4, Peter, who heard Jesus say it many times, for if God did not spare, first he re refers to the angels that were once holy, but they were cast down. And if God did not spare the ancient world, but save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in a flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, so he talks about Noah and then he talks about Lot, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, he condemned them to destruction, making them an example. Now don't forget, when God does things historically, God doesn't change. And right is still right, and wrong is still wrong, and he judges evil. He is long-suffering, and he is patient. But there's a limit to his patience. He was very patient with Lot. He was very patient with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, the Bible tells us, you can read in Genesis chapter 13, chapter 12. It says there that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were sinners before God and wicked exceedingly. And after they were carried away captive by Chedorlaomer and the kings of the north, they were rescued by God. He showed them mercy. But they didn't repent because of that judgment, and they turned right back to their sin. And just because we've seen some blessings from God doesn't mean that what we're doing is right. God is long-suffering. He is patient. He is merciful. But you can't flaunt your sin in the face of God indefinitely without facing the consequences. He has Sodom and Gomorrah before us as a judgment. He said it's an example to those who afterward live ungodly. First and foremost, it's an example to those who refuse to accept Jesus and turn from their sin there will be a day of judgment. There is going to be a day of fire and punishment. And it says, and he delivered righteous Lot. That's encouraging. Even though Lot was by bad choices, he was in the wrong city, surrounded by all that wickedness, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day, I don't know how you feel, but it seems to me like from day to day I am grieved by what I see happening in a culture that used to know better. From day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Have you read Ezekiel 9? You know, there's a mark in Revelation where people are destroyed, and there's a mark in Revelation where people are saved. It's called the seal of God. And in Ezekiel 9, it talks about people who are vexed, they are grieved, they are sighing and crying when they see the abominations that are being done. It ought to grieve our hearts when we see what's being done, not only in the country, in the world, but even in the church. We ought to be praying. We ought to see the sin and be grieved as God is grieved. But the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. That word temptation there not only means God saves you from temptation, but it means God saves you from times of testing from difficult times, and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Now, let's look specifically at what some of the signs were that Jesus gave us. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, and it says during Lot's time they ate and drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. That's talking about eating and drinking. Talking about signs of Christ's coming. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 16 and 17. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and the princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, when the king is the son of nobles and your princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. We got several channels dedicated to watching other people cook and eat. We even have competitive cooking, competitive eating. Eat and drink. 
You know, the, one of the sins of Sodom, we know about the sexual immorality, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but if you read in Ezekiel 16, verse 49, when this judgment came on Sodom, Peter read this, he knew that there was more to it than what we principally think of. It says, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. An abundance of food, an abundance of idleness. Do we have that in the country today? I don't know about you, but uh, you ever stood at Costco and watched people go by with their carts? They don't just have the typical little cage shopping cart. They've got a pallet that they push that you could use to fill up a semi, eating and drinking. In America, we want bigger portions, we want it cheaper, and we want it faster. And I, I know it's uh, difficult to say, but it is true that um, more people in North America will struggle with disease from overeating than undereating. In many parts of the world, actually. Eating and drinking. Is there anything wrong with eating and drinking? No, not if you're not eating the wrong things in the wrong quantity or drinking the wrong things in the wrong quantity. But we're living in an age where that does happen. <laughs> they made a law. Now, I don't think you should legalize everything and make everything illegal, but, you know, in New York, they said people's soda gulps were getting too big. So they made a law about how big a soda cup you could have. Of course, I think that's absurd. In a free country, if you want to sit on a pile of ants, you ought to be able to sit on a pile of ants. But to me, it, it just shows how bad it got that, that even the government said, look, you can't drink that much soda. <laughs> because even the government admits enough is enough. Jesus said, Luke 21, 34, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness, eating and drinking, and the cares of this life, that that day come upon you unaware. What day is Jesus talking about? His coming, the day of the Lord. We can become so preoccupied with things that are good, just living, that we forget about what really matters. Well, not only did they eat and drink, they bought and sold. And uh, there's more that we can buy and sell now than any other time in history. When you think about them buying and selling, we got whole channels dedicated to just constant shopping. And you can scarcely get online before a pop-up appears telling you to buy something. And sales coupons come like the leaves of autumn in the mail to buy more stuff with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. <laughs> and if you drive from our church after church down to Interstate 80, you're going to run into a bottleneck. The reason you're going to run into a bottleneck is because there's a shopping mall. And there's so many people that are going and they have no idea what they need, but they're going anyway. <laughs> they just know it's on sale. The stuff they don't know that they need is on sale. So you want to get a good price on things <laughs> by getting close to home? Someone said the modern man, he knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. James 4.13, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you don't know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor. It appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. Jesus especially warns against materialism in the last day when he says that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. I think we all know that uh, you can't take anything with you. It's like Job said, naked I came into the world, naked I go. One of the things about Noah that I admire, he invested everything he had into the ark. And uh, he had no regrets when the rain came because the stock he invested in floated. <laughs> Quite literally, he floated stock. You know, the idea is 
Oh, I remember, uh, I didn't see it, but I read uh, Ed Reed in his book, even at the door, he wrote, or, or it's, it's your money, isn't it? Karen and I read that book driving across Florida years ago. He said he, someone saw a, a U-Haul with the bikes strapped all over the top, the satellite dish on top and the bikes on the back and it was pulling a car that matched the U-Haul, had a bumper sticker and it said, he that dies with the most toys wins. But in reality, in the Christian life, it's kind of like playing Uno. You want to get rid of it all before the end, right? That's the winner. Is if you could just know the year before the Lord comes and then liquidate and put it into the Lord's work, wouldn't you like to all know so you could do that? Well, just play it safe. Do it now. <laughs> Which is worse? Getting rid of it too soon or getting rid of it too late? But you know how many are going to wait too late? Big difference between Noah and Lot. Noah invested everything. Lot waited too long and he lost everything. They bought and they sold. Jesus said you got to be willing to just walk away Luke 17, 31, in that day, what day is he talking about? Day of the Lord. He who is on his housetop and his goods, his stuff, is in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, one who's in the field, don't turn back and say, oh, but I got to get this and I got to get that. He said, run for your life. Do not look back. What happened to Lot's wife? She looked back. Well, not only did they eat and drink, not only did they buy and sell, they married. Now, is marriage bad? First miracle of Jesus. He went to a wedding. Adam and Eve got married by God. That's pretty special. Marriage is part of God's plan. So he's not talking about these things inherently being wrong. He's talking about an abuse of marriage, just like he's talking about an abuse of eating and drinking, an abuse of buying and selling. And marriage can be abused a number of ways for one thing. The Bible says don't marry the wrong person. Don't marry outside of your faith. You know, used to be years ago that not just our church but most major denominations including the Catholic Church it was cause for disfellowship or excommunication if you married out of the faith because it was such a clear command in the Bible. That's what brought destruction on the world in the days of Noah. Everyone thinks that they read Genesis 6 and they say the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all they chose. And they think that means that aliens or fallen angels married humans. It doesn't mean anything of the kind. It means the descendants of Seth that still were true to God. They were the sons of God. They began to look in the valley at the beautiful daughters of the descendants of Cain. And even though they knew that they had turned their back on God, they said, but they're pretty. Or he's handsome. And they began to intermarry, believers with unbelievers. And after that happened, the Bible says, then God saw wickedness and was great in the earth and the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil and violence filled the earth. It happened from the intermarriages between the believers and the unbelievers. And they just thought, oh, well, you know, I realize there's some, I go to church, they don't, but I'll study with them. That's what the children of Seth said. Yeah, we'll, we'll study with those girls. We'll bring them around. But how often have you seen in the Bible where the wives turned away the hearts of the kings? They married and they were given in marriage. Ways you could abuse marriage, marry the wrong person, marry out of the faith, marry the wrong number of people like Solomon did. And then, of course, marrying the wrong sex, which would be marrying the same sex, in case you're wondering. That is a certain natural self-evident truth. Doesn't matter how crazy the world gets, it's always going to be perfectly clear to me. And I understand there are people I recognize, I have friends, they struggle with these temptations. All of us struggle with temptation. But it doesn't mean that you legalize what is obviously and morally wrong. That just brings the standard of everything down. Instead of calling people to resist our natural bent, there are people that struggle with pornography. There are people who are pedophiles. There's all kinds of sexual temptation. Well, since when did a person's sexual preference make them a minority group? 
And it is the, the most ludicrous claims to start comparing people struggling with homosexual tendencies to racism and slavery and the oppression of women. This is a person's sexual interest. And it's now become a right. Whew. Is it just me? Or is this a sign of the times? By the way, I'm echoing the same thing that some of the Supreme Court justices said that were on the right side of this issue. They married. You know, it's interesting, Lot's wife is not mentioned until he gets to the land of Canaan. So you wonder if he waited until he got to Canaan and he married someone out of the faith. They married, they ate, they drank. What else did they do? They planted. Boy, we're planting more than we've ever planted before. And I'm not just talking about what they're planting up in Mendocino County and Trinity County and Humboldt County. All you've got to do is get on Google Earth and you'll know. Looks like little, no, they're all in like plots of 25 because that's how much you can grow medicinally. But uh, I went in my study last night to the world food data online and they're having record years of planting and harvesting of wheat crops and soybeans and rice in different parts of the world. Planting like never before. But it's not just that. We're doing more to modify what we plant and to engineer and genetically alter what we plant for bumper crops. I'm not trying to make a big deal out of that. I'm just telling you, never has man planted like he's planting now. Do you know at one time most people lived on farms. They planted largely what they'd eat and they'd sell a little more. Now most people live in the city because it's almost all mechanized. It takes very few people to run a farm with thousands of acres. I fly over the countryside and I still marvel at uh, just the scope of some of the farms and the irrigation. You can see it from the air. Planting like never before. You know, Jesus talks about a foolish man. Luke 12, 16, he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he said within I, myself, instead of sharing with the poor, wow, how can I cram all this food into a barn so that I can profit from it all? And he said, I'll build bigger barns. I'll tear down my old barns, build bigger barns. And there I'll put all my goods and say, sold. You've got many goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. And then God said to him, thou fool, this night your soul is required of you. Then who shall those things be for which you provided? It describes the, the attitude that the Lord is talking about. They bought and they sold, they married, they planted, they built. There's nothing wrong with building. I like building. Any of you ever built something before? It's a good thing. God commanded building at different times in history. But never has man built like this to a scope. It says in Isaiah 5, 8, Woe to those who join house to house, and they add field to field, till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. Now this is just actually, if you're wondering what's on the screen right there, that's the Rockland area from Google Earth. And uh, just laying house to house, yeah, you can cough and give your neighbor a cold. The house is so close together. <laughs> you know, a Chinese firm, this has just happened since. I, I did an amazing fact about this company. They broke their own record. A Chinese firm just built a, in April a building. Listen to this. A 57-story skyscraper in 19 days. I don't know what's with that. We need to invite the Chinese over here to help us with our church, right? The world will be preoccupied with embellishing our homes. Not only do we have channels dedicated to cooking and channels dedicated to buying, we've got channels dedicated to buying houses, fixing up houses, re decorating houses, and it's just we're so preoccupied with our dwelling places here, we don't think about our mansions there. And this is what Jesus is saying, nothing wrong with building. Who here doesn't want a comfortable home? But is that eclipsing the eternal picture for you? We become so preoccupied with the horizontal, we forget about the vertical. 
Now, when people do these things, Jesus is saying the planting, the marrying, the buying, the selling, the building. It's all with the idea that things are going to continue on and we'll have some security for some years to come. And Jesus said, and then suddenly. It was only, we read it last night in our worship. We were reading the book, Story of Redemption. Things, the sun was shining up until a week before the flood. The final things can happen very quickly. I think we're beginning to see an acceleration. You know, it's kind of like you're on half dome. You start walking towards the edge and you don't realize that it's getting gradually steeper and steeper in the angle of descent until pretty soon you might trip and start rolling and not know it. And we're getting now on that, that angle, that precipice where it's almost bending off in history and you're going to see things start picking up and snowball very quickly in the end. Knowing that won't save you. Knowing how close the end is won't save you. But if it becomes the means of helping you get serious about God where you've been sloppy in your relationship or in sharing your faith, then that's a good thing if it wakes us up. This is why Jesus said these things in his word. And then the other characteristic we've already touched on was the sexual perversion Jesus refers to. Jude 1 verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah, what was it like in the days of Lot? As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, given themselves, they surrendered to sexual immorality. This is kind of like what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 1. They gave themselves up to these things. They gave themselves over to sexual immorality, having gone after strange flesh. Strange means something that is out of the ordinary or perverted from God's plan. And set forth, they are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Let me read to you another verse. This is from the history of the kings. 1 Kings 14, 24. The time of greatest prosperity, affluence, peace in Israel's history was during the reign of what king? Solomon. 40 years. Solomon's son was Rehoboam. Started out with the best of intentions, but he was easily influenced by his friends, his young friends, to modify things. And li listen to what it says. 1 Kings 14, 24. Speaking about the early time of Rehoboam's reign, there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations that the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Rehoboam that Shishak king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. Even he took away all. Now put simply, when they gave themselves up to the immorality of the surrounding nations, they experienced a severe financial reverse. All the treasure was taken away. There's a few ways that God seems to deal with these things in the Bible. One is natural disasters, like a flood or fire. Another is economic disaster. And the other is war. You can see all three things happened as a judgment from God for the imm immorality of a nation. Now, the good news is, well, I don't know if it's good news or not, but it was 20 years from... Rehoboam allowing the Sodomites to run things and immorality. Finally, King Asa came along, the grandson of Rehoboam, and he brought about the reforms. And it says he took away the Sodom. And by the way, that's 1 Kings 15, next chapter, 1 Kings 15. What did he do? He took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. And there was a great reform and peace returned to the country. But you can't destroy the foundations and expect peace. God is patient. I'm not waiting for the sky to fall tomorrow because God is a long-suffering God, but judgment will come. Amen. Something will happen. God has not changed. And uh, so what does that mean for us? Oh, by the way, I never did read. Some people say, you know, the reason I, I'm emphasizing this, friends, is because you're going to hear all kinds of very creative things. I, I hear pastors in Christian, ostensibly Christian churches defending having practicing homosexuals in the church or in the clergy. And they say Sodom and Gomorrah was not talking about the immorality that people typically think of. It was, it was the pride and it was the, it was the violence. It was the other things. 
But you know, that's, that's not what it says. It, you keep reading in Ezekiel, it not only says they had fullness of bread, and it says they were haughty, Ezekiel 16, 50, they were haughty and they committed abominations before me and I took them away. You know, speaking of when the Lord comes, it says, and they were taken away, two women in the field, one taken, one left. They were taken away. It talks about judgment. Took them away. What is that abominations that they did before the Lord? Leviticus 18, 22. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. Now, there are varying degrees of sin. And God, all sin is wrong. You can be a heterosexual in sin. You can have homosexual inclinations in sin. You can have homosexual temptations. Different people are tempted in all different ways and certain things that would tempt you, I have no interest in. There's things that would be a temptation for me, you couldn't understand it. We're all different. But the Bible's clear, there are some things that are even especially more offensive to God. And those things that defile the image of God and reject the plan and the order of God, he cites as especially more offensive. Genesis 18, 20. God was speaking to Abraham and he said, because the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave. And it tells us what that was. I'm just afraid we're heading down this road of hedonism in North America. So what does all this mean and, and how do we relate to it all? Well, you know, it's not going to be like this forever. There's a time where probation will actually close for us as a people, as a country. You know, probation can close for individuals where it doesn't close for those around them. Like Judas, the Bible says he betrayed Christ. He went out and it was night. Probation fell for Saul. God would not speak to him. He tried to get the priest or someone to talk to him. Went to a witch. Judas hung himself. Saul fell on his sword. They self-destructed. Probation can fall on a married couple. Happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Probation, probation can close for a family, like the family of Achan. They all conspired together to steal. It was greed. It can close on cities like Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities of the plain. It can close for a nation like Babylon. And of course, probation will close for our world someday. Daniel 12, 1. And at that time, Michael will stand up. When a judge stands up, it means cases are closed, judgment is over. And we don't know when that's going to be. But there's a time coming when the door of mercy, where God is so gracious and patient, but it doesn't stay open forever. There's a time when it closes. If you die this week, your probation closes. It's appointed unto man once to die, after that, the judgment. Now, today, while you hear his voice, while you're alive is the time to respond to God's mercy. I don't know what you think might be worth more than everlasting life or what you're willing to gamble eternity on. You ever considered that God invites us to share his immortality? What in the world could be worth more than that? Not just immortality, immortality in a beautiful world. And that we get to share that with other people. Nothing in this world can be more important than that. Life that we can share life. But Michael will stand up. You know the Bible says, that great prince that stands watch over the sons of your people, and there'll be a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, people will be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. So, we're living in the days, I believe, right now, that Jesus compares to the time of Noah and Lot. But there's a difference in the way Noah and Lot were saved. First of all, Noah was saved with complete cooperation. He planned ahead, worked with the Lord. Lot was saved by the skin of his teeth. Noah invested all in God's work. Lot waited too long and he lost his whole investment. Lot chose a life of convenience. He wanted to live where the farming was good and the cities were good. He made no preparation for the future. Noah followed the life of hardship and holiness. Noah devoted his life to saving others and he saved his family. Lot spent his life thinking of his family's comfort and they were lost. So, assuming you want to be saved, do you want to happen, happen like Noah or like Lot? And even the daughters that were saved, 
Yeah, they didn't turn out right. The ones that were spared the destruction anyway. So how did Noah do it? He built an ark to the saving of his household. And he stored it with food. What good would it have been? Again, we were reading last night the story, just coincidence where we happen to be in the book, that uh, beautiful book, The Story of Redemption. I recommend it if you've never read it. And he was spending years building the stalls and storing food. Several weeks he stored enough food to last for a lot of critters and humans for years. They were on that boat for almost a year. They would have died of starvation or there would be a lot of extinct species right now if they hadn't made a plan to store. So how do we build and how do we store to prepare for those days? Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin. How did Jesus survive his great temptation? It is written, it is written, it is written. He had stored the word of God. We need to now know what we believe. You're going to be tested on every one of our points of faith. First of all, you need to know what you believe so you can share it with others. Secondly, the things I'm sharing with you are not very popular. They're growingly. You look at the Barna research and the number of people who profess Christianity and faith in God is diminishing in North America. It's no wonder what's happening with the media. There, there's a conspiracy with some in the media to just indoctrinate people with a different secular hedonistic way of thinking and Christianity is portrayed as ignorance and we're going to be challenged to defend what we believe and that's not the time for us to st stutter and to stammer and not know what to say. We need to study now to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed. Be ashamed, why? Because you can't give an answer. Peter says we need to be ready always to give an answer to anyone who asks us the reason for the hope that's in us with meekness and fear. We need to know what we believe. You don't have to be a pastor, but we ought to study enough to know how to share it, how to give an answer. Why do we think this is right or why do we think it's wrong? Because I live by the word of God and this is what it says. It is written. Are you storing? Are you building an ark? Preparing for what's coming? Probation is going to close. You know, the Bible tells us Will you bear with me just a few moments longer? The Bible tells us that um, God's people are being sealed. Just before the end, we need to receive that seal of God. Revelation 7, angels are preparing to release their grip on winds of strife that are going to blow through the world. There'll be a time of trouble such as there never has. Comes in two stages. First, a small time of trouble. People will not be able to buy or sell, better known as economic sanctions. If you do not cooperate with certain laws... And ultimately, there'll be a death decree. And before the angels release their grip on these winds of strife that are going to go through the world, God places a seal on the forehead of his servants. They're the ones who are sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in the land. They long for holiness. They're grieved by sin. They've got the mind of God. And he's going to place that seal on them. Are you receiving the seal of God now? Are you praying that you can reflect the character of Jesus in your life. You know, friends, you all know about the boiling frog scenario. We've been living in a culture where it just seems like little by little these changes are happening. Some of you who are older than I am, you would have been shocked if you thought this would ever happen in North America. We'd come to the place where we did not know that marriage was designed to be between one man and one woman. And by the way, it's supposed to be one man, one woman, until death do you part. But every institution of God is going to come under attack in these last days. And that's why we've got to know what we believe and we need to know that we're walking with the Lord and our lives are surrendered to Him. We need to pray God will give us wisdom to know how to represent Jesus in this very corrupt culture that we're living in so that gracefully, lovingly, we can still stand for the right, that our lives will be a testimony Many of us don't work day by day in Christian circles and we associate with these people that have a whole different worldview. We need to pray for wisdom to know how to share with them in a loving way. Amen? But God has, God has given us a message that I believe is the truth. Jesus did not say it's going to be popular in the last days, but it will be a saving message. And I want to believe that message, friends. Amen? Don't you? Amazing.
amazing facts began in 1965 with a God-inspired concept. Hello, this is Joe Cruz on the Amazing Facts broadcast, facts which affect you. Each radio broadcast would begin with an amazing fact from science, nature, or history, followed by a Bible message that touched the hearts of listeners from every walk of life. The program was an instant success, and the ministry soon began expanding to include Bible lessons. In 1986, Amazing Facts added the medium of television to its growing outreach efforts, offering soul-winning evangelistic messages for viewers around the world. In 1994, Pastor Doug Batchelor assumed leadership of the ministry, adding the Bible Answers Live call-in radio program, and new ministry TV programs began airing on multiple networks around the world. For 50 years, the driving vision of Amazing Facts has been the bold proclamation of the everlasting gospel. And with a team of evangelists circling the globe and thousands of men and women being trained through the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism program, AFCO, the ministry is helping God's church see a rich harvest of souls. Amazing Facts, God's message, our mission. Amazing facts change lives. I'm Clinkett Indian from Sitka, Alaska. My Clinkett name is Wish Dusty Cloud. It was a very depressing time for the people of Alaska. A lot of alcohol um, abuse was taking place. And unfortunately, my mother got caught up in the alcohol. It made myself and my siblings grow up in, in a, a pretty horrible environment. It was really hard to, to understand God. It was really hard to understand what love was. I ended up um, having a child in my 12th grade and um, leaving home when I was 15 years old. But somehow, some way, we made it. And I became a loner, I became a hermit. So I went up to the biggest marijuana county, to Humboldt County, and uh, started my new career. Things weren't right, though. No matter how nice I kept thinking life was, living up on top of the mountain, not having to worry about wearing clothing, just waking up and watching the plants grow, searching still for more and more. I went to the post office and I was standing there by myself. I looked down and here was this, what is called a handbill, a postcard. And the letters on it grabbed my attention and it said, Revelations. I'd never heard Revelation taught before, and I thought, gosh, that would have been so good. I looked at the time and the date, and I said, wow, that's today. And for six weeks, I sat there in the front seat of that building and could not believe the things that I heard. And I found this hunger that I had in my heart for decades being filled. I, I was actually like a starving child, you know, wanting to get in to learn more about revelations. And I chose to be baptized on April, April 3rd. Even though I chose to serve God, I kept falling. I was going to Bible studies all four times a week and just so hungry to learn as much as possible. God just overnight had me studying the Word of God through AFCO, and the miracles that happened through AFCO is so incredible. The only preacher I was listening to was Pastor Doug Batchelor, who I didn't even call by his name. I called him the caveman. And then here, all of a sudden, I'm sitting in front of him in his classroom learning from him. 
On October 11th, I sat there though in my room saying, Lord, here I am studying your word, but what, what am I doing here? What, what do I need to do? What is it you want me to do? And that night about one in the morning, God spoke to me and he said, I want you to write a note to Pastor Doug and tell him what you do. I sat there and I said, no, I'm not gonna write a note. I'm not gonna write a note. And I said, okay. So I ripped off a piece of paper and I wrote on the note and I said, I'm an experienced fashion designer. I can sew anything. I can make any patterns. If there's any way that I can be of any service to you, uh, God told me to be bold and tell you. And I walked up and I handed him the note and he didn't know what it was, but he said, thank you. And four hours later, I got a phone call from Amazing Facts. Pastor Doug told me that I was an answer to their prayers. They had been looking for a wardrobe stylist for their new film that they're producing. Action! Two, three! Amazing Facts has changed my life in the direction that God wants me to go. And now, out of all the knowledge that was taught to me, I'm able to go out into this world and share the gospel and finish the work for Jesus Christ. Friends, it's because of God's blessing and your support that thousands of others, like Nita, have found Jesus and everlasting life. Amazing Facts, through your faithful support, has had a major impact on some of the largest non-Christian locations in the world. Beyond the Great Wall, the printing and translation of our books and video materials are in constant motion. The Amazing Facts Chinese language website is now one of our most visited websites. We also translated thousands of pieces of literature for these nations. What started out as hundreds of followers is now in the hundreds of thousands. The impact of your funds invested in sharing the everlasting gospel in these foreign lands will be felt for years to come. You know, every week we hear the most incredible stories from all over the globe of lives that are being changed and hearts that are being transformed by the power of the word. And none of it could happen without your teamwork with this ministry. God bless you.